I'm so happy to be here. I'm honored to speak to us this morning. I want to thank God for the honor from the bishop and mom and the pastoral team for giving me this opportunity that I can share the word of God with us this morning. I want to believe that the Lord has intended good things for us and that as we sit here, he will speak to us because that is his plan and purpose. My name is Moses Wawero, and I'm born again this morning. I'm a father of two, and I'm glad that the Lord has been good to me this morning. Our topic this morning is on what we call benefits of thanksgiving. Tell someone benefits of thanksgiving. And as we sit here, I know all of us have given thanks in one way or another to someone. And uh, sometimes we may be wondering, what's Thanksgiving? Because we are in that season of celebrating 40 years of the, this ministry. And so we are in this last stretch where we want to thank God for what he has done. But when we think of the word Thanksgiving, it may have so many meanings. But this morning, I want us to look at the same word from the Greek meaning of that word. And the Greek name for the word thank, uh, thanksgiving is what we call eucharisteo. Don't you worry, you don't have to remember. But the word eucharisteo is made up of two words. And the first part of it is eu, which we, is a normal EU, which makes the U, and the other part is charis, which comes also from the word of when we say the grace of our Lord. That word is also found there, which means charis, which is grace. And therefore, when we talk about thanksgiving, it's acknowledging that God's grace works well. We're just acknowledging that God's grace works well. Why does it work well? It works well for us, for our eternal gain and his glory. So it works for our eternal gain and for God's glory. So when we give thanks, what we are saying, we are saying we are thankful for God's good grace. We are thankful for God's good grace. And therefore when we come and we are saying we are thankful, or we are thanking God for whatever he has done over the year, we are just thankful for God's good grace from the word Eucharisteo. And in Greek, uh, where or the origin of the Bible or the language that the Bible is written in, one word has so many meaning. It just, just, doesn't just mean one thing. Because even the ending of the word also tells us something about that word. And the ending of this word, Eucharisteo, or the last part of it, means the word can be broken into several parts, which would mean it can be broken into what we will call cases. And cases is where the word would be specific, like it was being spoken to or for to someone or for someone. Or maybe it was also spoken in soft language, or it was spoken as a command. The further it goes to tell us that the same word would also have what we call number. And a number, for those that do English, is where you say this word was spoken in first person, you know, tense, or second person, or third person. And so it would be speaking to many things when we look at the word. And it also have what we call gender. And it can be masculine, feminine, and it can also be neuter. It would be speaking to all those things. But this morning, I don't want to go into details, but I just want us to understand that the word Eucharisto, it is just speaking of God's good grace. And therefore, when we come here to thank God, we just want to ask ourselves, how has it been for the Lord to have brought us this far? Have we seen grace? Have we experienced grace? Because were it not for grace, none of us would be here this morning. Because we may have transgressed God. As we have just prayed, we are asking God to forgive us, to help us to humble. 
and as we pray that as we repent then he will hear us and then he will heal our land meaning we are not as righteous as we may look from outside bwana asifiwe meaning we are not as good as we may be portraying meaning that we are not as good as god would have expected us but because of reasons of his grace then the lord has allowed us to come into his presence praise the lord Father, the word grace, it would also be telling us something, or it's in what tense we call orist, and orist tense, because there are many tense, there are first tense, uh, uh, future tense, there is present tense, in def definite tenses, when you look at the word grace. But in the word thanksgiving, as picked in the verse that I'm going to be reading shortly, it denotes or what the orist tense is, it relates to a, or denotes a past tense of a verb, especially in Greek, which does not contain any reference to duration or completion of the action. So what it is telling us that this word does not relate to a duration, that thanksgiving cannot be set and said, we gave thanks last year, and therefore this moment we don't need to give thanks. And it does not say, since I did it yesterday, I have no opportunity of giving thanks today. That tense says we can keep, though it's a past tense, though we thanked God yesterday, today we have another opportunity of thanking God. So it doesn't have a completion of action. It could mean it is continuous. We can keep giving thanks to God. And I would want us to look at it from the Bible in the book of Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. And this is a story that we know. And the Bible says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village then, a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, saying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. I like the part that says, have mercy on us. Verse 14, when Jesus, when he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. I would also want you to take note of the word, praise at that moment and verse 16 he fell down at Jesus' feet in thanksgiving or thanked him and he was a Samaritan in verse 17 Jesus asked where were not all ten cleansed where are the other nine in verse 19 then Jesus said rise go your faith has made you well. Born as if you're son. Now, just that portion of scripture is just reminding us that there were people that had cried to God and we know the story of these ten lepers. And when Jesus was just passing by, they cried to him and asked Jesus, have mercy on us. And when they approached him, then the Bible tells us that he told them, go and show yourself to the priests. And on their way, they were all cleansed. And after that, then the Bible tells us of this one person that came back to him and gave praise to him. But as he was doing that, then the Bible tells us that Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. At that very moment then, this person also gave thanks to God, which tells us that after a miracle, what is expected of, of us is us coming back to God and thanking him for what he has done. But I would want to in, tell us this morning that the minute God does anything, that is just the beginning of things that God wants to do in our life. Because once we get to know that Jesus has done something, it is not that moment that we need to run away that we need to disappear from his presence. Because the question that Jesus asked after that was, where are the other nine? We cleansed all I, I, I gave, all my grace was made sufficient to all of you. But where are all the other nine? 
And this is a question that all of us would find ourselves in. Because many are times that God does something. Or many are the moments that we have that thing that we are telling God, have mercy on, on me. Because human beings, we have so many challenges. And I want to believe even this morning as we came to the house of the Lord, we came telling God, God have mercy on me. On whatever issue that it would be. But because God is faithful, God has come this morning to say that he has made you whole. But that is not the very last thing that God wants to do with you. Because once he does something, he wants you to come back. Like the one leper. And when he came, he praised God. Or he praised Jesus. And in the process, then Jesus says, you have been made whole. And I want to suggest to us that for us to be able to honor God and to know God in a deeper way, that is where our miracle begins. When we return to him and worship him and praise him and thank him. And therefore it means it's not conditional. It is not an option that you have to choose whether you need to come back to Christ to say thank you. Just like salvation, the journey that God has given us or the journey that we are in, it's demanded of us that we keep coming back to God. We'll keep coming back to him because even in salvation, just because you got saved, that was not the end. That was just but the beginning of your salvation journey. Because there are many other things. It's true. By the day you got saved, you are justified. You are made whole. You are restored back to God. But the process of sanctification is a whole process that is a lifetime. That you need to keep coming closer to God every day so that he can make you whole. If you just walk away from God just because you get got born again, then you go before you can see clearly. You need to return to God so that you can say, Lord, touch me yet again. So that he can help you walk the journey that is set before you. In so understanding, then God reveals him secret or reveals his secrets to his friends. That action of just returning was a process of wanting to build a relationship, a relationship with God. And God cannot just be so leprous, just as we are. We don't tell our secrets to our friends when we have not known them fully. Isn't that so? You only reveal your secrets to a friend that you have walked with. Someone that you have known. Someone that you can believe and someone that you can trust. And therefore, in thanksgiving, we recognize the essence of God's grace. And even in this ministry, when we are saying we are celebrating 40 years, I sat here last Sunday and I was asking myself, am I part of the 40? Because you could be here and you are wondering, they are celebrating 40, what am I celebrating? But for the reasons that thanksgiving is appreciating God's goodness or grace, then all of us has room, have room to thank God for one thing or another. Praise the Lord. And so as I counted my years, I've been here for almost 28 years. And for that time, then I remembered, I have seen God walk with this ministry. I have seen God carry this ministry to where it is. But in the same time, God has also been good to me. God has also been gracious to me. And so as we celebrate 40 years, I have also a reason to thank God because his grace has also been sufficient to me. So God wants us to know that he wants us to know that it is grace that has carried us so far. You know, when Jesus came, he had a hard time trying to introduce the kingdom. And why was it? It's because when we get to understand the purposes for which we are here, one, God wants us to glorify him. This leper came, and by worshiping, he was acknowledging that there is power in God. God wants to make himself known to us. God also wants to reconcile the world back to himself. And God wants to show his way to mankind. So for every act that God does, it is not because he just wants to make you happy. God does everything that he does in your life, not because he is so much intending to make you happy. But he wants you to know the Father. He wants to know you to know, to glorify God. And he wants you to reconcile, or he wants to reconcile the world back to him. You know, Jesus, after he was just about to die, and he's telling the father that 
God, Father, I'm just about to come to you. And I have done everything that you had asked of me. Now glorify yourself, even as I have glorified yourself. Praise the Lord. It was painful for Jesus to be here, but he's saying, I have done everything. I have gathered everyone that you gave unto me, except the son of perdition. Now glorify yourself. How much more is God willing to glorify himself through those many acts that he's going to do through you? The many miracles that he's going to perform in your life. He's not so intended that you will be up and about jumping, speaking of your miracle without him being seen in that miracle. Benefit number one of why we are grateful to God is because God wants us to acknowledge his lordship. And why would God want us to acknowledge his lordship? In definition for the word acknowledgement is an expression of appreciation or gratitude. In other words, it's the state of quality of being recognized or acknowledged. So God wants us to acknowledge his lordship. And in one of the many things that God, God's lordship has been acknowledged is because God has always helped us. You know, I'm a firm believer that there is nothing that is called I'm a self-made person. I'm a self-made millionaire. I don't know who you are. Whether when you sit down, you think of yourself and you say, I'm self-made so and so. Because in the process of doing so, God wants you to acknowledge his lordship. And how is it a benefit? It's because when you honor God and God is acknowledged in your life, then he moves to show himself that he's able on your behalf. We find this in the book of Exodus 1 and verse 15. And it talks of the Hebrew women that had been charged by the king to kill every first born of every son that was born to the Hebrew women. But the Bible gives us an analogy of this midwife, and in verse 19, it tells us that the midwife answered Pharaoh, and he said, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before a midwife lives. What are they saying? They are saying that it is true, we have all these challenges. And for those women that have given birth, they know it's not an easy process. Some of you have to go through labor for hours. But for these Hebrew women, they only were so vigorous that even before a midwife arrived, the child was right there. When I thought of this, it reminded me of some time back when I had been called by a member of this church to take them to hospital one night. And from this place to the hospital, the lady was in anguish and in pain. But lo and behold, immediately we got to the hospital. Even before I parked my car to join them, the lady had given birth. And so we just walked into the hospital with a baby. That is vigorousness. That is what God wants us to do or to bring to pass in our lives. That as men struggle to make life, God wants you to give enablement. God wants to give you empowerment. And this will be the acknowledgement that you have a God. I also imagine when you look at nature, the animals in the world there, that will, because of the nature, that for an antelope to give birth, it does not struggle, but things happen so fast. Because right behind a lion would be waiting. But because God has ordained that this young one has to survive, then the antelope is so vigorous, without help, without a midwife, it gives birth. And this is the acknowledgement that God is supreme, that the lordship of God, he controls the universe. He controls everything that happens around us. But on the contrary, we are also told of something that happened that made not just uh, the Hebrew women to acknowledge that God was so much in their life. But for the children of Israel at some point in their life, they also walked before other nations and they thought that would it also not be good if we had a king like every other nation. And so they tell Samuel that Samuel, we now need a king. Give us a king. We want someone who goes before us. Just like it is possible for all of us this morning. That because of the situations and circumstances that we are in, we would be saying we don't want to acknowledge that God that gives us vigor, that gives us power, but now we want a king. And so God told Samuel, 
just listen to them. Because it's not you that they are rejecting, but it is me that they are rejecting. God gave all the condition why a king would not suit them. But God still said, give them a king because they want one. Just like sometimes we find ourselves when we are not able to acknowledge God's grace, that thank, thankfulness to God, when we cannot appreciate that his hand is at work, we get to a point of saying, God, we want a king. God, I want a husband, whichever way. God, I want to be settled. I want this money, whichever way. And you know what? God is also saying, just let it be. If that's what you want, if I don't have a place in your heart, if you cannot acknowledge me that I'm able to do what you seek of me, let it be. But we want to thank God that by God's grace, this sons, uh, the whole episode that we have just seen, on one hand, the Hebrew women acknowledged, or the Sifra and poor acknowledged that the power of God was so much at work. But for the children of Israel, they say, we don't want that God. We want to have our own God. What would God be speaking to us on that? He's saying that we need to come to God and let him be. Because when I looked at it from the New Testament, it also takes us to this place when Jesus was just about to be crucified. And in Matthew chapter 27, from verse uh, 25, there are about, then the Bible says, uh, all the people answered. And who are they answering? They were answering Pilate. And they were telling him, his blood be on us and our own children. Because they could not acknowledge God as their God, as their Lord. They are saying, for we don't acknowledge Jesus. Give us Barnabas. He, better, he will suit us better than Jesus that you are talking about. And so Pilate broke his pen because he found no sin in Jesus and asked them, what do you want me to do? And they said, let his blood be on us and our children. I know that is the hardest prayer to make, but it was a beautiful prayer because it was prophetic that though they rejected him, his blood was still to be upon them and their children just as it is on us today and our children. Hallelujah. Number two on why we need the, bene any, uh, the other benefits of us giving thanks or acknowledging God's grace is because we appreciate God's sovereignty. We appreciate God's sovereignty. In the book of Psalms, this is one of those books that is, has the richest compilation of powerful prayers, hymns, poems, which include every human emotion possible, which is anger, frustration, fear, and sadness, to please, joy, elation, wonder, gratitude, and everything in between. The same book of Psalms, it has more than any other book in the Bible, it is believed to be the most, uh, most widely read and most profoundly cherished of all other books. And not only so, it is because we also relate to what the book says. It also reminds us that we are not alone in our struggles, concerns, and our uncertainty in this life that we are in. The book of Psalms, sometimes it's also called Tehirim, which means books of praise or Bible within the Bible because it covers all the major themes of the Bible story. The key word in the, in the book of Psalms is the word praise. And why is it? It's because it has been mentioned 211 times. What then would this issue be all about? It's because the book of Psalms has been broken into five key portions. And one of them is that the word praise or the portions that have been picked as praises, they talk about us worshiping God, extolling God with a heartfelt gratitude, giving thanks to the sovereign or to the sovereignty of God of Israel for his, pas for his pas uh, person, his word, his mighty works in regard to both creation and redemption. So the biggest part of the book of Psalms is speaking 
to God's greatness. It is speaking to us being grateful to him. It is speaking to sovereignty of God, of his person, not of his doing, of who God is in the life of his people. He's speaking of his mighty works in both creation and redemption. The other part of the same book, other, uh, the other part that it's broken into, it speaks about pain. And why pain? It's because the psalmist describe, describes in graphic fas uh, fashion his personal doubts, fears, reassurances, direction, protection, and strength. So if you read the book of Psalms, there are so many things that you pick. And one of the many things is how he cries before God. Remember me, oh God. And just like we were reminded last Sunday, he's telling us that we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Which says, unless God has mercy on us, human life will have challenges. But how do we overcome those challenges? It is because of doing what the psalmist do, did. Though written by many others, where we have David, we have Solomon, we have Asaph, we have King Solomon, we have Jeremiah, we have Moses. They wrote, but they wrote from the experiences of life. That they went through pain. But as they went through pain, then what stands out is praise. Praise stands out because it speaks about us seeing God as who he is. Praise the Lord. We, it would be interesting as for us to know the difference between thanksgiving and praise. And in thanksgiving, what happens is we focus on blessing received and expressing gratitude for what God has done for us. But in praise, it focuses on God's character, attribute, abilities, expressing admiration and worship for who he is. This takes us back to what I said that this person that came back to Jesus was not just contended because of the healing miracle. But he realized this person is different than any other person. And so his thanksgiving and worship changed from just thanking God for that one miracle to worshiping God for who he is. To praising God for who he is. And in everything that then God is doing in our life, he wants us to move from just being so happy that he did a miracle yesterday, that he gave you a job yesterday, that he made a way for you yesterday, that he created room for you yesterday. He wants us to move and come to the place of praise. Praise the Lord. Where we look at God's character, his attributes, his abilities, we express admiration and worship him for who he is. And therefore, that means that our praise is not past tense. Because every morning, God gives us an opportunity to see his attributes, to see who he is, to see his character. And then we bow and worship him. And in so doing, we acknowledge God's sovereignty. So in the part of your anguish, your pain, it would be interesting that God is enthroned. And all that he wants you to know is to know him, how he will deliver you from him himself from and from your adversary. Because God, you need to be delivered from God. Because if God comes upon you, he, the Bible tells us it is uh, scaring to fall in the hands of God. Because if God has set everything to run as it, it should, then if you fall in his hand, you can only be delivered by God. And when God wants to deliver you from him himself, he also wants to deliver you from his, your adversaries. And how do we then do that? It is because we get to the place of praise. It's because we come to the book of Psalms and we read the whole of it. We see the anguish of everybody there. But at the end of it, we jump from pain. We come to the place of praise where we thank God for who he is in our lives. Hallelujah. Isaiah 43 speaks to us on the same. And he's telling us in a few of the verses in that book, and he's just saying that it's only God who can deliver us from himself. In verse 11, he says, I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no savior but me. I alone decree and saved and proclaimed. You, so you are my witness, declares the Lord, that I am God. Even from eternity, 
I am he. And not, uh, and none can deliver out of my hand when I act. Who can reverse it? So the Lord says, it is only him who wants us to get to that place where he delivers us and makes us to what he wants us to become. The other benefit is that when we give thanks or when we appreciate the grace of God's goodness, it births or it brings to life humbleness and humility. How is that so? You know, there are many times that we go through thick and thin. And in Psalms 24, the Bible tells us of the children of Israel, and it speaks and says, if the Lord had not been our side, let Israel say, now declare, if the Lord had not been on our side when men attacked us, when their anger flared against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. Then the floods would have engulfed us. Then the torrents would have overwhelmed us. Then the raging waters would have swept us away. But blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The net is torn, and we have slipped away. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. For us to be able to know God as a benefit, when he does whatever he does, he brings humbleness and humility. It is because you get to that point where you look at yourself and say, had the Lord not been on my side, this year I would not be where I am. Had the Lord not fought my battle, then I would not be where I am. And so when I thought of it, I got to this point of imagining that God does everything so that he can uh, demonstrate his power in battle. So that we may not stand to speak of our greatness, of our, how able we are, but that we may stand and speak of how great and how able God is. And so I thought of it and I remembered a few times there are many times that people tell us, thank you. And you know, it's not just enough to keep telling someone, thank you, thank you, as much as it's good. But we need to move from that point where we think of how God wants us to bring us to a point of showing himself. And when he does it, then we break before him and worship him because of who he is. John the Baptist speaking about it. He speaks of Jesus coming before him. And we, when he talks of him in John 3 and verse 27, he says, John replied, a man can receive only what is given from heaven. You yourself can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend of bridegroom stands and listens to him and is overjoyed to hear the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine and it's now complete. He must increase. I must decrease. For us to worship God and as a way of praising God, when we get to meet God, then something happens. There is an exchange. There is that moment that we decrease and he increases. And this should be our prayer, that as much as God does the many things, the great wonders that he will continue to do in our lives, we need to get to that place where John says, I must decrease even as he increases. This is the benefit, that we no longer struggle with pride, with self-exhortation, with self-glorification, because the Lord has come, and we are decreasing even as he increases in our lives. So humbleness is no longer a problem with us. This is not our prayer that we keep telling God, God humble me. The moment we encounter God and we see his greatness, we don't need to pray a prayer for humbleness. We humble before him because we decrease as he increases in our lives. The ultimate goal of all that God does in our life for us and through us is that we may decrease and that he may increase in our lives. The other benefit as I come to conclusion is when we see God's grace at work in our lives, 
it triggers true worship in our lives. In the story in the book of Exodus chapter 33, the Bible tells us of Moses telling God, and he's telling God, if you don't go with us, then don't allow us to leave this place. But the Bible also in verse 10 gives us something that causes us to get to a place of worshiping God. And as we worship him, it happened with the children of Israel. One of the things from that story, the Bible tells us that God had asked the children of Israel to do the many things that he had requested of them. But every time they had, uh, he made requests, their heart never changed. Their heart was still, they were still, or they had stiff naked hearts before God. And so Moses would have to approach God very often times so that God would come and forgive them that he would move together with them. But in verse 10, the Bible tells us, when all the people saw the pillar of crowd, stand at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. What was happening at this point? It is because Moses would move to the tent of the meeting where the glory of God would come down. And every time it came down, God would speak to Moses as a man speak to another man, one on one. But for the children of Israel, they stood at the entrance of their tent and watched Moses as he entered into the tent of the meeting. And when that happened, the glory of God came down in a big way that they feared and they trembled before God. And that alone caused them to worship God. Though they were wicked, though they had uh, stiff naked had, uh, necks before God, they were arrogant. They could not appreciate what God had done because God is telling Moses, right from Egypt, they have not honored me. I have tried all that I could, but they have not honored me. But every time the glory of God came down, they all fell down and worshipped God. When we acknowledge the grace of God in our lives, it triggers worship. We need not to be told how to worship. We need not to be reminded that it's time to worship. All that we need is to get to, into God's presence and look at him and see, though we are wicked, he still calls us back to himself that he may continue to sojourn with us. And when that happens, God needs us to get to another place that is speaking in the book of Psalms 51. And this is where David is telling God, for you do not delight in a sacrifice. I would bring it to you. You take no pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. This is what the Lord wants. That we need to stop walking before God in our own self-will. In our own righteousness. But we need to be broken for God is looking for worshippers. And he says the time is coming and the time is now. That the true worshippers shall worship God in spirit and in truth. And it's not in Jerusalem. But it can worship God wherever they are. Because that's what God wants us to do. And lastly, the, other, the last benefit, though there could be many other benefits, is when we acknowledge the grace of God, goodness in our lives, it empowers us to trust God for the next territory. It empowers you to trust God for the next territory. And I think this can be well summed up in the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And this is David speaking to Saul the king. And it's because their enemy, uh, Saul, uh, uh, Goriath, had come out and mocked the armies of God. And so when he stands there, he says, from verse 34, he tells him, he says to, uh, to, to Saul, and David replied, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear come, or came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine 
We will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Our acknowledge God's grace empowers us to trust God for the next territory. When David is saying this, he's telling Saul that though you give me your armor, though you give me your weapon, I have trusted the grace of God when I was young. And now that I'm here, I'm able to trust him for the next level. For the next territory, God is going to give it to me. And so in our thanksgiving today and in our acknowledging God, every encounter that you have had, it should be fuel for the next miracle, for the next territory, and for the next thanksgiving that God is expecting for you. And therefore, as you sit here this morning, I want to believe that God is at work to make you not to faint, to make you not to feel like you need to give up. I came here a few years ago and I remember one sermon that was preached here. And as I walked out of the service, I felt so discouraged because at that point I was struggling between falling off or keeping up with God. But in church that morning, there was a prophecy. And the prophecy was God assuring us that I will be with you. Don't look back, I will be with you. And I took to heart that prophecy that morning. But as I walked down the stair, the voice of, of God was so heavy in my heart. Because I was debating in my heart and I was asking, do I keep on moving with you or do I let go? And that morning, I had some negotiation with God. And the issue was, I had many issues that were placing on at my place of work. And so as I walked down the stairs there, I told God, how can you not fight my battles at my place of work, yet you're expecting me to work with you? And I told him, if you can fight my battles, then I will know I also need to work with you. And as I did that that morning, it is true, God came through and fought my battles. He really did it. And as I looked back, I remembered that God is saying, don't give up. I'm still at work in your life. I'm still concerned about you. Don't go that route that you are taking. Because God is just about to give you a benefit. He's just about to lift you up. He's just about to encourage you. You could be there. And this morning, you're at that verge of giving up. I'm here to remind you. God wants to establish himself in you. He wants you to acknowledge him. He wants you to stand and say, I determine that I don't need another king. You are my king. I determine you are sovereign over all the issues of my life. I will give you praise. And if you have not made him your Lord and Savior, he is inviting you. He gives no benefit to anyone. He says, I do not call you now slaves. I call you friends. Because I can reveal my secrets to you to make you know what I desire of you. And so this morning, you could be here, yet you are not a son. Yet you are not a friend of God. He's inviting you. If we bow our heads, I would ask if you are there and you're asking the Lord, God, I have not experienced any of these benefits in my life. But this morning, I believe and trust that you are able to change my course to give you a new turn of things and for you to show yourself that I can say with David that I was young, I was in the field but when the lions and the bears came, Father you helped me and even now I believe that even in the next territory you are going to help me. If you are there and you would want us to agree with you you can lift up your hand and the Lord will fight your battles, the Lord will come in for you the Lord will defend you. The Lord will enable you to move into the next part of your life. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for granting us this morning that we can be in your presence and that we can call on your name. Your word has said that those that are called your name are saved. And therefore this morning we call on your name because we are believers that our salvation in you, our Father, when men trust in horses and chariots, Father, we want to trust in you, God of heaven, who says, let there be and things get to be our Father. Before you are your people, before you are your servant, 
Father, in the many things that any one of us may find themselves in this morning, we want to lift up your name. We want to enthrone you, our Father, even by acknowledging the grace of God in our lives and in our beings, our Father. And because of that grace, our Father, we want to bring you praise, our Father. We want to acknowledge that there is no God like you, O oh God, that you alone reign, our Father, that you alone you are king, that you alone you are able, our Father, above every other thing, our Father. That circumstance, that situation, dear Father, that hardship, dear Father, that confusion, dear Master, even in the life of your people this morning, you want to render every such situation powerless and declare our Lord, you who says, who can save from your hand, you alone can save and deliver us even from our very enemies, our Lord. And so this morning, we give you thanks. We give you praise before we believe that you are doing it to the glory, even to the honor of your name. Be thou glorified and be thou exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.